Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Bill Fisher with the School of Information at San Jose State University. And I'm here to moderate our colloquium session today. Our speaker is Dr. Mary Ann Harlan, who's a lecturer with the School of Information at San Jose. And her topic today will be uh, the Common Core, an introduction for libraries. Dr. Harlan has an MLIS from San Jose State that she received in 1999 and has an extensive background working in middle school and high school libraries. In 2008, she joined the first cohort of the San Jose Queensland University of Technology PhD Gateway Program and received her PhD in 2012, uh, being, I, I believe she was the third person to get her PhD through the program. So um, let me welcome Dr. Harlan and turn things over to her. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fisher. And yes, I was the third person to receive my PhD. So let me get to my starting slide. Here we go. Common Core and what it might mean. So what my plan is today is to just do a really brief introduction to um, Common Core state standards. I know that there's been a lot of um, information around them, but I want to sort of maybe just do an overview, give you a little bit about the history and the development. I'm going to introduce them through the English language arts standards and talk about some of the shifts and the differences in um, what it means for instruction and specifically around text shifts and then I'm hoping to talk a little bit about what the impacts might be on libraries particularly public and academic libraries because most of this is very general so I expect school librarians will have a lot of this information already and it wouldn't it's not possible to talk about the Common Core without discussing some of the politics and controversy around it because generally the um, news information that is out there is mostly about the politics and the controversy. So I felt as if it was necessary to at least address some of those um, particular areas of concern around Common Core. And I, I probably will reference it a little bit throughout, but I will go into it in detail at the end. So let me just to give you a little bit of background about the Common Core. Uh, in 2008, David Coleman and Jason Zimba penned an essay, uh, an essay for the Carnegie Foundation about state standards. And it had grown out of work with the, from the No Child Left Behind data, because No Child Left Behind required these um, summative high stakes tests at the end of each school year, which were generally um, standardized fill-in-the-bubble tests. And they were determining that what those tests were telling them from the standards is that um, it told you a lot about what a child might know, but not a lot about how they were learning. And certainly not, it had some limitations in trying to understand um, how, what students could apply beyond of their knowledge. So they wrote this essay that called for fewer and clearer standards that were focused on work skills, that were focused on informational text, real world learning, and less rote memorization, which is where Nickleby had somewhat taken us uh, th through the way that the law was being implemented. At the same time, the Council of Chief State School Officers, which is an um, organization of people who are state superintendents of schools or public school officers of each state and the National Governors Association were sort of thinking about the same types of questions. You know, what, it, what does this really tell us about what students are learning? And they read the um, Carnegie essay and contacted Coleman and they began developing um, the Common Core Standards in 2009. Much of this was funded by the Gates Foundation. They're not the only funders, but um, a tremendous amount of it has been funded by Gates. And this is important because this is part of the conversation around the politics and controversy of it. Um, and so the, the actual writing of the standards and the way the standards were developed was funded by Gates. And then this implementation piece is also being funded pretty heavily by the Gates Foundation as well. There were some goals that were attached to the Common Core um, standards. 
the, the one would be that they were the same standards that were adopted nationally, that they emphasized process and um, skills rather than specific content knowledge, although content is still included, and that they helped students develop critical thinking gil, um, skills, skills. <laughs> critical thinking skills and student learning opportunities. And in education, we tend to say that this is a guide on the side model versus a sage on the stage, which is what I'm doing right now, right, lecturing to you. So, and they were also um, emphasizing non-scripted curriculum. This is key because this is one of, also one of the components of complaint around what's happening with Common Core in regards to scripted versus non-scripted curriculum. Nick will be, um, for students that were struggling, often put curriculum in front of teachers that said, in order to teach this standard, this is how you teach it, this is what you say, this is how long you take, this is what the students do, and then you move on to the next thing. And so teachers weren't necessarily developing their own curriculum. And Common Core was hoping to do away with that. So these were these like kind of lofty goals that were attached to the Common Core standards. Sorry, I tried to PowerPoint it. So, um, Broadly and quickly, Common Core was adopted. Right now it's 43 states. That's actually down a little bit because um, it was this intense, amazing, speedy adoption. And many states adopted Common Core, and some states adopted it and ran with it. A uh, good example of that would be the state of New York, which adopted, implemented, and tested within two years, whereas California has been a little slower. Um, last year they piloted the tests. They're sort of moving slowly <laughs> into actually doing um, to, to doing the sort of assessment that's around it and, and doing the rollout of Common Core. There are some states, those are those little yellow states that haven't adopted Common Core. Texas, Virginia, and Alaska have been very, very clear that they're not interested. And um, because of the size of Texas, that is somewhat significant to the conversation as well. So that's the way, this is what it looks like right now. And um, this map is evolving, and it's probably going more yellow than green these days, but it is basically where we're at in terms of what, what states are doing it. So you will see that there is somewhat of a national movement attached to what's happening around Common Core adoption. So I mentioned I'm going to focus on the English language arts standards, and I'm going to do that rather than the math standards because um, there's a, there's a component and addition in the ELI standards that um, reaches out to other subject areas, but this is where the types of things that we are interested in um, libraries where our, our role in Common Core sort of plays out. It's much more so in English language arts than in math because of the reading and the research components of the ELI standards. So they're actually broken up into four areas, reading, writing, speaking and listening, and language. And then additionally, reading is broken down even further, and this is significant because of some um, conversation around this between literature and informational texts. And then they have foundational skills, which are the types of reading skills that translate between literary analysis and informational texts. Additionally, and this is new, um, compared to what Nickleby did, they have literacy in history and social studies, science and technical subjects, and writing. So they've added these sort of areas, or I'm sorry, writing is actually part of the science and technical subject in history and social studies. So they've added these areas in. One of the things that had occurred um, under Nickleby was a focus on reading and writing and a focus on math. And what you lost was, um, especially in elementary schools, you lost things in science you lost um, history curriculum, and so this has brought that back in, and it acknowledges that there's literacy skills that take place in, in those subject areas, and that everybody in the school is responsible for those particular things. So it's just helpful to see the way the standards are laid out. You've got the four areas, but you also have a second subsection of standards, which is in literacy and history and social studies, science and technical subjects. So some of you may have seen there's a thing called there's six shifts um, from Achieve the Core, but really what the Common Core group does on the corestandards.org site is to acknowledge three shifts. They are regular practice with complex text and in-context academic language. 
and I'll talk a little bit about what a complex text is in, the, in just a minute. But they're also uh, reading and writing and speaking needs to be grounded in evidence from those texts, both literary and informational. So a res uh, return to the text when you're writing or speaking in order to emphasize um, a point or to make an argument. And that we build knowledge through content-rich nonfiction. And so there's a real shift move, movement into nonfiction and informational text, and I think that's probably what libraries have heard the most about. And so you can see these three shifts if you visit thecorestandards.org. I wanted to bring out an observation that I've made, which is that compared to previous standards, I would suggest that Common Core emphasizes learning from diverse sources in an active manner, much more so than previously. One of the things that's written into the Common Core is that we're not teaching teachers how to, or we're not telling teachers how to teach, and that we want students to be active learners, and that they are not to learn specifically just from the teacher, but from a variety of different texts. Now, how this is being implemented is of concern and of question, but it should be noted that in the actual document themselves, this is what they're emphasizing is this learning from diverse sources in an active manner. So I want to talk a little bit about text shifts. I've read the first round, first draft of the Common Core Standards in 2000 and early 2010, and I was a little disturbed because there was a real emphasis on text, and it didn't acknowledge media in any other way, shapes, or form. And I made that comment in public discussion, and apparently I was not the only one, because one of the things that the Common Core Standards has managed to do is to acknowledge and include the idea of a non-print text. It, um, it actually writes in visual literacy and media literacy into the actual standards themselves. It still feels like an overlay rather than a really rich way of working with those texts, but it is there. It also emphasizes real-world complex text. So there's a difference between a considerate text, and the best example of that is a textbook and a complex text. So a considerate text is, a, um, is the type of informational text that you open, and it has headings, and it has subheadings, and oftentimes unknown words are in bold because you know you're going to be able to find them in the glossary, and they're um, the definition is, when it's first introduced, is right within the text of the statement. Uh, almost always the thesis statement of a paragraph is the first statement that you see, and it's very straightforward. That is a considerate text. Almost all, te almost all textbooks are considerate texts. In fact, that's the perfect example of what a considerate text is. A complex text is the type of text that we use in the real world. Um, my personal example, because I have such a hard time trying to decipher it, is a tax code. But there's different um, other types of complex text, policy briefs, um, argument papers. Uh, a good example of one of the a complex text that you can use that is a speech, that's a non-print text, would be um, the Obama race speech in the 2008 election, that's a complex text. Or even Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech is a much more um, familiar sort of thing. So the idea is that you use these types of, of texts in order to teach history or to teach uh, rhetoric or even to teach science. So if you're teaching science, are you using a um, peer-reviewed article, which even though it's considerate, has some complexity to it, right? And then there's an emphasis on informational text, and early on in the Common Core, this received a lot of, of uh, focus. What it is is that uh, it recommends that by the time kids are in upper elementary school, fifth and sixth grade, that they're reading 50-50, 50 fiction, 50% 50 fiction, 50% nonfiction, and that by the time they reach high school and secondary levels, they're reading 80% informational text and 20% fiction text. What should be noted about this is that that's 80% of the reading that they do in school in toto, not just in their English class. So even though we see these as English language art standards, when they talk about reading 80% of their of the text in school, 80% of that should come from social studies, science, English, art, even math, all of those types of different areas. So those are the um, informational text that you see. So it's not 
of, of your English curriculum now becomes informational text, it's 80% of the overall curriculum. And I think that's an important note because otherwise it all falls on the English teacher, which isn't fair. So this is just this emphasis on informational text and getting teachers to move away from just relying solely on the textbook. So one of the things that the Common Core does is they have anchor standards, and they have anchor standards in reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And I'm really just going to focus on reading and writing. And each of these anchor standards have like substandards below them. Each of these anchor standards have substandards below them. So they've gone undergone a task analysis that says that in order to actually meet these anchor standards, you have to do this. And they're what's called spiraled, so they build upon each other from K to 12. But I want to talk about what those anchor standards are in relationship to what it means to us in the library. So for ELA literacy reading standard one, read closely to determine what the text says to explicitly and make logical inferences from it, cite textual evidence when writing or speaking to support conclusions, is very much what we do when we write a research paper. As a student, we read closely to determine what the text says, we make some decisions about how that fits within our research project, and we cite that specific textual evidence. So for school librarians that are teaching, this particular standard is very much embedded in our information literacy standards. And so as students, school librarians have an opportunity to sort of contribute to this, and they see themselves as a space within Common Core. Uh, the standards, not implementation. They see themselves in space with com Common Core. But I think you'll see that this will helpfully help in the academic world in terms of articulation as students move outside of the school and into college, which is the idea, and academic librarians will see them more prepared. But also you might see um, some impact in the, school, in the public libraries as well. So you can see there's some other standards. I'm not going to address them. I wanted to pull out the ones that I thought or most significant. In craft and structure, assess how a point of view or purpose shapes the content and style of, te of a text. If we're talking information literacy, this is the evaluation of information, identifying bias and how that might impact the text. I also want to point out this idea of content and style of a text. So we talked a little bit about using complex real world text. So a point of view might shape the way you um, present a graphic novel, for example. Um, is it, or we're even looking at things that are, um, is it first person or third person? Even this will impact the text. And so as you're working with students or um, who are standing in front of you, you may have this opportunity to talk about these types of things. The third section is integration of knowledge and ideas. And all of this, by the way, is also going to show up in writing, you're going to see. So this idea that we integrate and evaluate content and diverse media. I mentioned that there's this at least acknowledgement of other media and formats. And the delineate and evaluate argument and specific claims in a text is very much tied to research projects as students are working on research projects. And then um, down at the bottom, it's a little hard to see, so let me just bring it out really quick. There's this range of reading and level of text complexity. Um, so read and comprehend complex literary and informational text independently and proficiently. So there's this key piece down here where public libraries are really going to live because they provide independent reading often. So that's a key component for you guys right down there in the range of reading and level of text complexity. So you have these um, four separate areas and these ten anchor standards and they can be broken down into little pieces. It looks the exact same thing in writing, right? So we have the text types and purposes. So this idea that there's different genres of writing that we engage in. One thing that the Cotton Core does, maybe to a fault, is focus on the idea of writing an argument. So this idea that everything is an argument. And so everything that they do is focused on that. But that's really good for libraries who are interested in the ethical use of information and using information to understand. So 
writing um, text that use valid reasoning and relevant and sufficient evidence. And if you're going to use relevant and sufficient evidence, you need to cite it. Um, that you write texts that are um, through effective selection, organization, and analysis of content. So this is about how we organize our writing and present it um, to, to others, right? So you can see in terms of the text types and purposes that it really relies heavily on this idea of argument, which is very t closely tied to research papers as kids write them. Um, production and distribution of writing, and this is one of the places where it's really interesting because there's some challenges and some interesting opportunities here that probably to this point um, have been somewhat ignored, which is this use of technology to produce and publish writing and interact and collaborate with others. One of the things that this does is it allows us to open up our world so that it's not just happening in the school. So that public libraries, if they're participating in any type of connected learning activities that um, are helping kids who use technology to produce and publish, then they're participating in common core standards themselves. And in academic libraries, the same thing. So it's one of those places where all in the sun you've opened up the space. Now this might be a little rose-colored glasses for me. I know that there's people who will be really critical of that idea, but it definitely exists. And additionally, one of the things that's sort of in that task analysis that's not clear there is the idea of how we do that ethically while protecting our privacy and producing our identity online, something that librarians think about quite a bit in terms of privacy protection. So I think this is a really key and really interesting um, standard that is often overlooked or ignored. Not many people are talking about this because they're so focused on how to teach writing. And, but it's certainly a place where libraries can engage within the types of the common core activities. So there's um, the production and distribution of writing. The next one is all us. <laughs> Um, and this is something that you're going to see really clearly at the academic library level is that hopefully if we are good at, at teaching our students at the K-12 levels, it'll make it easier for you. You won't have to start all over at the very beginning. But one of the things that they do in the anchor standards is this short and more sustained research projects. And so there's a focus on doing research in Common Core that didn't exist in the other um, other standards. And so it's very much there. It's very front and center. It Obviously, anybody who has any idea of working with anybody doing research, you know you understand that there is a lot of tasks involved in this. And that if you look closely at the ACRL standards, that you will see that there are a ton of things that actually are required if you're going to do a short or sustained research project with focus questions, blah, blah, blah. Gathering relevant information from multiple print and digital sources, assessing the credibility and accuracy, and integrating the information while avoiding plagiarism. That's what we do in academic libraries when we teach information literacy. Uh, certainly what we do in school libraries if we're lucky enough to have a school librarian who's teaching information literacy. So it's very much where libraries live. And then drawing evidence from literary or informational text to support analysis, reflection, and research. This is pretty much all the same thing. These can all be broken down in certain ways, but these all relate back in to information literacy, to the accessing, the evaluation, the use, and the creation of information. And then finally, you have the range of writing, which is they're looking for you to write over an extended time frame or for a shorter time frame for different tasks and purposes and audiences. So what does this mean for public libraries? And I've mentioned this a little bit throughout, but specific, let's get, let's get down to brass tacks. What is it really going to mean if you're a public librarian in a state where Common Core is being implemented? Uh, there's going to be some collection and curriculum needs that may shift for your public library, specifically depending on how um, your community, what type of school library support you have in your community. So you always should have a collaborative partnership with your school. Not everybody does, but it's a, it's a good practice to have a collaborative partnership with your school in order to help them with this because you might 
you might be finding that they need help around some of these topics and areas. Um, there's an, the emphasis on nonfiction. My guess is, and I, you're starting to hear from some public librarians that this is happening, that their summer reading list is now has more nonfiction on it, especially narrative nonfiction on it. When the kids show up and say, I need to read a book before school, the list will see, you will see more nonfiction. You may um, receive requests to have more nonfiction on your, on the types of reading lists that you might put together for summer reading lists. You will probably no longer, I mean, you will still have the parent that's standing in front of you telling you that they need an accelerated reader book for their student or for their kid, but um, there might be, you might now see people coming in and saying, I need a nonfiction book for a book report for my class. So in terms of thinking about that around collection and curriculum needs, you might see a shift in terms of the nonfiction. I suspect you should also see an uptick in the usage of your databases, both by students and potentially by teachers. You know, if you really want to form a great partnership with your school, teaching teachers how to use the databases because it's really difficult to find complex texts for Common Core, so that's one of those places. I'm also Public librarians are great at modeling reading skills, right? They do this all the time with story, mod, um, story time. So when you're reading to a group of um, stu uh, young ones and their parents, a lot of times you're modeling for their parents, but you're reading to little kids, you're like, oh, what do you think is going to happen next? This is modeling prediction. Or well, you'll say, now what just happened? That's modeling like a summary. And so you will still be doing that. But you might find yourself needing to model evidence and I just mean by that, like, where do you see on this picture that this is happening and having kids point on the picture and um, if you're doing a picture book, those types of modeling where you're looking for the evidence in the text and getting kids embedded in this idea of where the evidence is in the text that you're reading in the terms of story time modeling. And it's going to take practice to make that natural, but I suspect that's where it's going to happen. You're also going to need technology support. I mean, there's a, one of the big problems with Common Core is an, um, an assumption that youth are digital natives and that because they're digital natives, they know how to do things online. And there's, that's a huge assumption and that's a false one and it's, got, it's based on a myth that is problematic. So the youth that are coming in are going to need help searching databases and effectively searching the web. Um, especially if you're working in an area where there is no school support for this, um, for no school librarian support for this, because teachers have struggled, a lot of teachers struggle with this as well. So especially the older teachers who didn't go through college using databases. So this is going to be one of those places where public libraries may find themselves. Um, it's not your job to teach the kids a, Really, that's not the purpose of the public library, but you may find yourself filling in in those types of places. And then um, I want to point out, this is one of the concerns around um, Common Core is that the assessment piece of this is on a computer, <laughs> it's online, which means kids need to know how to navigate online. And for some kids, the public library is the place where they learn how to do that. Uh, they don't have computers at home, they certainly don't have internet access at home, so just even fiddling with a mouse sometimes is very difficult for them. And so this is one of those places where public libraries may find themselves contributing to um, common, the development of Common Core skills. In terms of the academics, I think the academic library may find this, it's, it's going to take a generation of students, in other words, to say it's going to take six to ten years before you start seeing students that come into this, um, into your libraries who are well prepared, but hopefully you will see students that are coming in uh, to your libraries that are well prepared and you can see um, in the red where I sort of pointed out some things. There's but the ACRL um, are adopting new standards and they are adopting threshold concepts are part of this and so I've just pulled out the threshold concepts. And so this idea that scholarship is a conversation, remember that we are emphasizing in Common Core multiple sources and the integration of those sources. And so what we're talking about here is that recognizing that people have different um, contributions to an idea and that that's what happens in these sources and, and scholarship. 
this idea that authority is constructed and contextual. Again, there's an emphasis on evaluating the argument, particularly around validity and how point of view and purpose will shape a text, right? This is around the idea of what is authority and how do we construct it and how is it contextualized. Um, format as process, right? That um, how we select and organize and put together a text impacts the format, but also the process of doing that helps us learn. So you can see how the Common Core Standards fit within these first three um, threshold concepts. Sorry, I lost the term there, threshold concepts. And to continue, one of the threshold concepts is that information has value. And this is where these ideas of citing your sources and you, um, specifically around evidence and um, avoiding plagiarism points to the idea that information does have value, that it is worth something, and that we need to ethically engage in the use of information. So the, interestingly enough with the ACRL, I, I think, and with college and research libraries and academic librarians, I'm hoping um, optimistically that what you'll see are students coming in that are more prepared to use your libraries. Maybe not the nuts and bolts of it, but the actual ways that the library is being used. I would hope that that's going to happen. You also may think about ways that you can um, help at the secondary level teachers start to understand how students might be able to use the, ac use the academic library more effectively based on what they're doing. So, how can I teach teachers? And again, not really your role, right? And I know you're all very, very busy, but these are things that might actually help you in the long run. But certainly Common Core allows us to have a focus on these types of ideas of information having value and scholarship as conversation. These types of things are embedded in Common Core as it's written. So, I keep pointing out as it's written because there's a difference between writing something and implementing somebody, something. And implementation has been um, of concern. But I want to address some of the controversies because I've painted a very rosy picture and a very positive picture of Common Core. And at, at its core in the standards, I've painted that picture because I believe in it. But I do understand that there are some real concerns and I want to address those because I think it's necessary and I think it's helpful to get context for the actual, um, for the standards themselves. So the first is, is that the development of the standards was not transparent enough and lacked practicing teachers. And I would suggest that that's likely true. I was well aware of the development of the Common Core Standards and I know that they were open to public comment because like I said, I commented on them. But the architects, quote unquote, architects of Common Core, David Coleman being one of them, have never actually been practicing teachers at any level, not just K-12, but at the top as well. And so, and that's true of some of the CC of the state school officers as well. So there is a concern around that element of that. But I will say they were open to public comment, they did take public comment, and they certainly changed from that. The, the next of it is the money. Um, there's a cynical position that this is a money maker. Certainly there's people who are concerned about the billionaire boys club money that comes into this from Bill Gates. Um, Anthony Cody is very critical of this if you're interested in following up on that. And certainly we all have reason to be concerned about Pearson's role because Pearson stands to make a great deal of money out of uh, the testing and the implementation piece of it because they're designing one piece of the test and they're certainly designing a lot of the curriculum that goes along with it. And so it's questionable, Pearson is a publishing company, it's questionable what their role is and why they exist. So it's one of the places where the controversy really exists, which is where the money is coming from to implement this. Furthermore, there's a lot of concern about federal interference. When you look at this at a state by state level, there are a number of states who feel, and you may have heard this, that um, these are standards that the feds are forcing us to implement and that it interferes with the local control of school. Actually, 
you don't have to implement the standards, but what the, st what the federal government did is they tied federal monies, which almost all states rely on, to race to the top funding. They tied that to the adoption of common core standards and included in that the assessment piece that goes along with common core standards and how we assess teachers as well. So it gets very, it's very tied up. And there are um, uh, the governor of California and the um, Arnie Duncan uh, from the Department of Ed had a little set to last year about um, the way we were doing assessment and they threatened to withhold money from California, we eventually got it released. Oklahoma right now is facing that because um, the federal government has decided that uh, their standards are not rigorous enough after they are talking about getting rid of common core standards. So there is some serious con um, concern. You will find in states that have Republican governors and Republican um, uh, legislatures that they are constantly attacking co uh, the common core standards for being a federal overreach. And it's not that the Fed has said you have to do this, it's that they've said if you don't do this, we're not funding you. In terms of the implementation, one of the biggest concerns is that these were not piloted. I can paint a rosy picture of these standards, but we don't know anything yet. They were widely wholesale adopted and implemented without us really understanding what it was going to look like, how it was going to work, what types of infrastructures that we were going to need to have in place. And this is probably a legitimate concern about the um, about it. And Diane Ravitch, who's an educational historian, is the most vocal about the fact that these have been implemented without being piloted. Early childhood literacy educators have been very clear that at the K-3 level, these are developmentally inappropriate standards. They've written, um, there's a open letter from a number of them that it's, these are not research-based, they're developmentally inappropriate for the younger K-3 students, and it's probably true. <laughs> um, certainly, they're asking a lot, and so there's concerns around the K-3 um, level of this and early childhood literacy. I did point out with the story time that there's ways you can start to model the ideas embedded in Common Core, but it's difficult and we need to think about what that means for the littles. Um, and then, even though Common Core explicitly states we're not teaching teachers how to teach, um, because of this assumption that teaching reading and writing is easy, there are some teachers who feel over their heads. So teaching reading and writing is really, really hard. But because we all read and we all write, we think that's teaching it is easy. And um, preparing teachers to teach Common Core at the elementary and then also in regards to um, subject areas, history and, so, and um, science is a large undertaking. It's going to be very difficult. And it's based on this assumption that it's easy to do it because we all do it. And it's a really false assumption. And what's happened, what's come out of that is we're seeing scripted and um, scripted curriculum where it's being handed over to the teacher. Here's what you teach. Here's the standard. Here's how you teach it. Here's what you say. Here's what the student does. Here's how you grade it. And here's the time frame that it's supposed to happen on. And it's making, it, it's upsetting. And it, but it's not what it's supposed to be. It's just what's happening. And so this is one of those um, concerns that in some districts you're seeing a lot of scripted curriculum and in other districts what you're seeing is a lot of professional development. And frankly, um, where I live, some districts are just flat out ignoring it as far as I can tell. So there's that element. Um, and then finally, and this is probably the biggest piece because you cannot separate the two, and that is the assessment piece of this. There's a real concern about overassessment. Um, it doesn't get rid of high stakes testing. It ties high stake testing to teacher tenure um, in a lot of ways that it's being implemented. The idea is supposed to be that you can give your students a test and get instantaneous feedback that you can then use to like determine how you teach, but doesn't seem to be happening. So one of the things I saw recently is a testing schedule for Miami-Dade that had kindergartners, test, kindergartners testing in the first week of school. Um, 
end of August, kindergartners taking a standardized test. If you were a junior in high school, you had three standardized tests in the first month and a half of school, which includes the SAT, ACT. But this, this focus on testing, on standardized testing, and this over-assessment piece of it, and it's um, really concerning because you're looking at second graders and you're expecting them to take a test. And this is a lot of what you hear out of New York um, is the sobbing children <laughs> is, has to do with this idea of overassessment. So this is one of the politics and contra controversial pieces of Common Core. Um, and you hear a lot of it out of New York because the New York Times is huge and it's everywhere. So <laughs> that's one of the reasons. Um, the other thing is that there's a lack of infrastructure. Because the testing is all done on computers, there are numbers of schools who had to go out and buy computers in order to make Common Core work. Georgia, as a state, actually realized that this was a problem and has backed out of the assessment piece, as I understand it, because they didn't have the money to A, train their teachers, and B, provide the infrastructure. When you're in a rural community, you might not even have the necessary broadband. So this lack of infrastructure is a real problem. And what's happened is, is that it takes a lot of money to put the infrastructure in place. And what that means is no libraries and no library services. It means no a lot of other things as well, but it's a very big problem. And I also mentioned a little bit earlier that it makes an assumption just that the teaching and reading and writing is easy, is that every kid knows to how to sit down and navigate a computer, how to use a keyboard, how to use a mouse, how to click and drag, <laughs> and it's, it's not a functional reality. So some students are actually not doing well on the test, not because they don't understand the material, but because they don't understand the format of the test. They don't understand the computer, and this is problematic for them. So this is another one of the concerns, is this idea of uh, all kids know how to be on a computer, and then not all kids know how to be on a computer. And the idea of teaching technical literacy skills um, to youth is not embedded in Common Core. So there's no money, there's no funding, there's no focus on that. While we're very busy trying to teach them how to read and write in ways that we want them to read and write with Common Core, we're not teaching them this. And so this is one of those other concerns and certainly a place I mentioned with a public library where they can contribute but it's not going to solve it. So that's what goes on. Those are the mostly when you hear people criticizing Common Core, it's based on something on this list, either the way it was developed, uh, the K3, um, the mostly it's around the assessment piece and what that assessment actually means and what the problems are with the assessment. And they're all legitimate concerns. And they're all things that need to be addressed. So what's happening, because it's a, education is a state-by-state state, um, decision, different states are handling it different ways. Some states are looking to back out of the Common Core, like Indiana. Um, Alabama is consistently trying to back out of it if they haven't been able to yet. Um, other states have just renamed the standards. So it's not the Common Core standards, it's the Iowa State standards, but they look exactly the same. Other states have determined not to get involved. Virginia is looking at it and saying our standards of student learning are um, adequate and rigorous enough and we don't need to adopt Common Core. Um, and it's, so it's happening in various different states. And so despite the idea that we have a national set of standards, uh, it's not happening for a number of different reasons and it looks different in different ways, but it's still kind of trying to move towards that goal. So, I mean, I would hope that in a few years what you're going to see is that we've answered all of those questions and we've figured out the implementation problems and that academic libraries are going to see kids come in and know how to research, uh, which I know is not happening now, uh, but we'll see how that plays out. So that's um, pretty much what I have as far as an overview of it. I hope you found it useful, and I'm here if you have questions. Great. Thank you, uh, Marianne, uh, for that uh, very enlightening presentation. Uh, if anybody does have a question, you can either put something into the chat box, you can raise your hand, you can uh, simply grab uh, a microphone. Um, because we have it set up for multiple speakers. Uh, and while you're thinking of, of something, um, Marianne, I don't want to put you on the spot, but are you aware of any other 
um, countries besides the United States that have done anything like this, and uh, have they been, if, if you know of, of something, have they been more successful, less successful than what's going on uh, in the U.S., especially with the apparent adoption of these things and now states trying to back out? Um, well, this is an interesting thing, right, because we like to point to other countries all the time and say, well, we want to be as good as Finland or we want to be as good as Singapore or, you know, and um, these are countries that have national standards, but they also have contextual components that um, are part of the, that conversation that need to be taken into account. So, for example, um, the way teachers are treated, the expectations, the value of a K-12 teacher, um, the fact that like, so Finland is a really good example where they have um, pretty much national standards. They test off the charts on their standardized tests, but one of the reasons why that is is that teachers are actually allowed to teach. Um, nobody's giving them scripted curriculum. So that's part and part um, component of it. Additionally, one of the other contextual pieces of it, and this isn't just an excuse, but we need to actually put this into the conversation if we're going to talk about it, is that if you compare, um, if you do a regression analysis of, of students in the United States based on socioeconomic status um, compared to the socioeconomic status of the students in Finland, uh, we actually test higher than them for the same level of, of socioeconomic status. So it's when you bring in, um, so poverty really is an issue and um, one of the things that education reformers like to say is that um, it's all about high expectations and it's not really about poverty. and. Common Core doesn't address poverty, but poverty is an issue and it isn't just about high expectations and we have numerous and overwhelming amounts of research to that point. And so it is problematic. So I know it's happening in other places, but there's contextual components um, in regards to the way we treat um, preschool and healthcare and um, those types of things for our youth that actually are important in this conversation. So you can't just overlay a set of standards, no matter what Michelle Ree would like to have us think. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments from our participants today? Doesn't look like we have any, so again, let me thank you, Marianne, for your uh, presentation. And uh, we have uh, the uh, recording uh, you see there it will be available. And then we will also have this uh, done on a YouTube version, and we will um, make that available uh, for uh, everyone uh, and get that out on the uh, uh, Information Schools uh, message to students when that uh, uh, version of the presentation is available. So again, thank you, Mary Ann, thank our participants, and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you, Bill, and thanks, Randy, for your support, and uh, Lindsay for tweeting like a mad woman. I was seeing it come up on the side. <laughs>